Hey guys, Ryan here. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is a labor of love every week. And with that comes many different costs to keep the show running. That's where our Patreon campaign comes in. You give what you think the show is worth. There's different rewards available all the time, including shoutouts on the show, early editions of main episodes, bonus episodes and content, and very soon, monthly patron hangouts, where we sit back and chat all things UFOs. So I hope you'll consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support and keep looking up. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Spread. Hey guys, Ryan Sprague here from Somewhere in the Skies, coming to you live from Scotland. I'm actually in a hotel because I don't have Wi-Fi yet in my new apartment in Scotland. So you're getting um, this nice brick background. Don't get used to it. It's just for tonight. Uh, This is a special occasion. I needed the best Wi-Fi I could get to make sure that this interview went off without a hitch. And I'm really excited to talk to these guys about their new project, estimate of the situation. Uh, There's a history to this project. Uh, I have been talking and discussing it with Tom, one of the creators of estimate of the situation uh, for (laughs) over a year now. I remember uh, very early in the creative stages of this comic book series, which we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, him sending me ideas and, and images about what this comic book was going to be. And the minute I saw what these guys were doing. I was all in. And it's here. It is finally here. So we're going to get the, you know, the breakdown of what the comic is, how it be- came to be. And um, yeah, just hear about the creative and research process process of estimate of the situation. So without further ado, let's bring them in. We have Tom Orzachowski and John Zoitos, the writers and creators of estimate of the situation. Gentlemen, welcome to Somewhere in the Skies. What's up, man? Thank you, man. What's yeah, very on? excited to be here. Uh, this is our first one. You know, we've uh, we've just <laughs> been burning the midnight candle, and uh, you know, like we're finally excited to actually talk about it for a second. You know, and you got a chance to read it, so that's even uh, even better. Yes. Now, you guys were kind enough to send me an advanced copy of the first issue of the comic, and uh, whew, yeah, it blew me away. And you know, again. Here at Somewhere in the Skies, we support any creatives that get themselves uh, entangled into this weird UFO community and world that uh, we live in every day. And I know you guys are uh, are feeling that now. You know, I know this isn't the first or last show you're going to be on talking about this. But um, I will actually want to start with uh, Comic-Con. You guys recently attended New York Comic-Con and you had a booth there and everything to uh, promote the comic. So yeah, let's start there. What was it like going to New York Comic Con and actually like being able to show your work there? I can't even imagine. Oh man, well, it. Uh, I mean, it was fun, don't get me wrong, but uh, we actually submitted an application way back in the summer and we never heard from anybody, right? So we were like, okay, well, we know the, the, the barrier of entry is pretty high. So we're like, okay, we didn't get in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then two weeks prior to Comic-Con actually like, you know, happening, we got an email saying like, Hey, we have a booth available. Do you guys still want it? You know? And so we're just like, I remember asking John, like, should we do this? Like, this is, this is really the last minute. We, we didn't even have the first issue finished yet. You know what I mean? Like, oh, we're wow. like, what the hell do we do? Um, then we just said yes. And we took it and, uh, we worked literally day and night to get the first issue out with our artists. You know, we were editing, you know, till like six in the morning, um, then like doing the same thing the next day for days. And then also setting up the booth, like getting the posters and all that stuff. And we had no idea what to expect really. Um, but it was fun. Like once we got there, once we got settled, I gotta say like the, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're nobodies basically, the new kids on the block, but like the reception we got was really cool. You know, people 
who were interested in this topic, like came over and asked us what this was about. And as soon as we told them, you know, like that it's based on declassified documents, et cetera, et cetera, you know, they were in, right? But like what's even more interesting, they were in, they would bought the copy, then they would talk to us about like, like chemtrails for 40 minutes or, or their experience <laughs> or something like that, you know, like, like a vast majority of things. So it was really interesting communicating with people that way. And it showed us like, yeah, there, there's, you know, not just a market for this, but there's people hungry for something like this. Cause like, you know, every other UFO story is basically like an Independence Day invasion movie. You know, it, it just, it, 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 it's, it's cheap for, for lack of a better word. Um, and seeing the enthusiasm there was pretty cool. And of course, Comic-Con's Comic-Con, man. Like we, um, it was massive. We ended up just buying a bunch of stuff that we didn't need, you know, like <laughs> every time we'd go to the bathroom, we'd come back with like a, like a $40 poster or something where it's like, oh my God, like what are we doing? Yeah. Spending uh, any profit you might have made. Yeah, that sounds like Comic Con. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, John, what was your experience like? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, I got to say, the way Tom was able to pull everything together was quite amazing. I mean, literally, we were editing every day. I mean, I w I'm at work sending him dialogue edits and he's sending me back notes and we're going back and forth, like through WhatsApp and text. Um, so it really was, uh, uh, like trial by fire, um, yeah. like that setup right there with the, you, you know, we, he went to Staples, got the big tablecloth, put it over, got the posters. Um, you know, we had to, I did not think we were going to show up in Comic-Con with a printed issue because the artists also had to bring back panels. So oh, I thought we were going to come with like a business card and pamphlets and, <laughs> um, you know, maybe an email list. And it's like, we'll let you know when it comes out. Um, because we, you know, we understood that it was, a great opportunity to get that booth also because we can get it next year as well. Um, you kind of hold it in contracts. We're like, you know what? It's worth it anyway. Um, but really the best, biggest part of it, the best part was the momentum it gave us and the drive it gave us to actually finish the issue. Um, you know, the issue we have, which you got, uh, you know, black and white, but um, the black and white actually looks great. So um, yeah. it's almost like a uh, black and white limited edition. Uh, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a blast. I mean, um, and really inspiring just being around and seeing all the other creator owned work too. Like it yeah. actually made me feel, and I'm sure Tom as well, like, oh, we're, we're actually in this now. Like we're actually creators. Cause like you said, we're, yeah. we're nobody's, we're just starting now. Yeah. It made so, it real. Right. Well, right. I can yeah. only imagine that surreal moment of just sitting there and having someone hold something, you know, that you'd been working on, um, you know, as a, author or or even a podcaster like when people reach out to me and say hey i listen to your show you don't think about that as someone who is just cranking this stuff out like it's a job for you and you know you're you're just worried about getting out the next show and the next show you don't stop to think wow people are actually reading my work they're actually listening to the show and those are truly the moments where you're like yeah this is like this is real this is happening and you know, I was watching your guys' social media and seeing all the people holding the, you know, the uh, the first issue, and that that had to feel pretty awesome. Even saw Dan Zetterstrom, our our mutual colleague, and here in the UK, UFO researcher, with one of the copies, who traveled all the way from England to come over there and um, meet you guys and and do some other stuff over there. But that that must have been pretty cool, like you know, having actual UFO researchers show up to the booth and be like, yep, stamp of approval. Yep, it's good. Yeah, yeah, no, he came by. It was pretty cool. Um, he came by. There was a, an experiencer, uh, a, a talk with Gary Nolan and a bunch of others. So, like, you know, it was happening during the same time as Comic-Con on Saturday. I got to meet everybody afterwards, like Dan, Jay, uh, Tupa, uh, a bunch of others. So, like, that was, that was, like, really, really fun. It was really, really interesting. You know, and I got to say, too, like, I got to shout out, you know, Derry Fletcher, who those posters you see in our cover art, he's the one that did it. And like, this guy is just amazing. You know, like I found him on UFO Twitter and he's been such an integral part of the project since, you know, like I, I, I he did the cover that you're seeing right now on the left side, the red one and like all the mm -hmm. all the other, you know, like the military installation, things like that. And uh, yeah, I mean it was such a, it was a showstopper because people would come by and like, that's the first thing they would see. And that's why they would come to the booth and talk to us. And, you know, again, this just proves that like this community runs deep and there's a lot of talent here and a lot of people who are passionate about this, you know, and, and Darry is just one of those people that has like come through every single time and even like cued me up like, Hey, 
uh, do you need anything for me? I have X, Y, Z days off. I'm like, uh, yeah, like, give me a second. <laughs> Let me figure out what I need. Um, even if I didn't need anything, you know, just because he's so talented. Um, so again, this community is it, just one of those things that like it's it does it, it's a very niche community, um, and it, it's it's you know there's a there's there's personalities within the community, but overall everyone's in there for the same reason. Uh, they are passionate about this subject, and they they do want to see it you know done justice one way or another. Where it's you know advocating for disclosure, um, you know, uh, completing the historical record or representation in media that isn't just like you know spooky X Files music with like you know, bug monsters or something like that. So, yeah. Right. And I think that's what, uh, and we'll definitely discuss kind of the, the uh, theme and the tone of the comic, but yeah, you guys aren't going with a little green men, at least not yet. Uh, the story you're telling is very, uh, it's a side of ufology that a lot of people don't cover. And, and that's what I found most interesting about it is this idea of, um, you know, how this topic can be used in certain ways and for certain motives within the U.S. government and intelligence agencies. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. John, um, I know kind of Tom's origin story, but I'd love to know, like, what what got you, and Tom, I want to know this too from you, what got you guys interested in UFOs to begin with? What's kind of your, um, your initiation into this crazy weird world of UFOs? Uh, experiences or just growing up with the x-files i'd love to hear each of your uh your origin stories john let's start with you yeah i mean what's interesting i you know i don't um i was never big into uh the ufos or the ufo theory it was really tom that came to me with i mean we would have discussions over it over the years because we love to have our conspiracy discussions we met in acting school and became good friends so we've known each other what tom like eight years now almost eight years, yeah yeah um and so he came to me with this project idea, which I thought was fascinating right off the bat. Um, so I came on board that way. But really, I was an outsider coming in, really looking at it with fresh eyes. I didn't know the specifics, certainly not the specifics of um, the UFO sightings throughout the 40s. Um, I knew basically about Kenneth Arnold. That was about it um, in, the, in the way Kenneth Arnold, you know, uh, is, is sort of this pop culture figure um, and maybe a little more than that, you know, maybe a little more than your average layman. But for the most part, um, I came in through Tom and it was really through doing the research for this project that I became really fascinated with the UFO theory. Um, I mean, that's really what pushed, it was really research first because I was still like, uh, you know, oh, I'll help edit, maybe flesh out the idea. We'll throw the ideas back and forth. But then really going into the research, I was like, oh no, I actually want to be really involved. <laughs> um right so yeah, Which, so yeah that's really my story it wasn't i wasn't uh i wasn't part of that uh i wasn't in the ufo uh world until i was brought on for the project that's so cool man because i hear that all the time working with you know in television when it comes to ufos you know you have the crew the cameramen you have the directors and they're not entrenched in this stuff but it's a job for them and uh it's a project and then once they get you know, going with it, they're like, whoa, like, this is a whole world I never knew was out there. And now, you know, I've got cameramen that I've worked with in the past reaching out to me, be like, dude, did you see that UFO in San Diego? Or like, oh, what the hell was over Scotland this week? It's it's pretty cool. Like that, you know, even if you are coming from an outside perspective, uh, this topic desperately needs that too. It needs the new fresh eyes to look at it. Because um, Tom knows he, you you get so involved in this that you expect everyone um, in the outside world to know who Kenneth Arnold is or to know where Roswell is. I can't tell you how many people think Roswell's in Nevada or something yeah. like that, you know? So it's, it's interesting, but um, yeah, Tom, yeah. how did you first get interested in UFOs? What brought you into this world? I, I mean, I, I, I was always interested as a kid. I don't, I can't tell you why, honestly, um, it was something that gravitated I, I, it was a topic I gravitated to. I mean, I had a particular like sighting, I would say, when I was younger that kind of like influenced me later on. But, you know, it wasn't anything crazy. It was just something that like, you're like, whoa, what was that? But this this uh, under or this overwhelming feeling rather that, you know, they're lying to you <laughs> and like you want to figure out why are they lying to you? Right. Um, so with this project specifically, you know, like it, it was really getting to the history of it. And like I, I was tired of 
talking to people about it and then not being versed in, you know, in, in the dates, the names and things like that. Just pretty much why I think this was the, uh, why I think this, this really did happen. And part of bringing John on, which was really, really cool. And it's really cool about like the, the, the tandem that we have, you know, like I, I come in from the lens, like, no, no, something definitely happened, you know, and, and we're going to figure out how and why. Whereas John was like, like, yeah, I don't know. But the, more we got into the research, the more we got into the the, the, the documentation. The, and, and of course, there's researchers previous to us like uh, J Jan Alderick, you know, Wendy Connors, um, a bunch of other people that like really completed historical record. The more we dove and sunk our teeth into it, the more we're like, oh shit, no, something happened, and and they're clearly lying about it. You know, whether it's it's little green men or or whatever, you know, that that's up for debate, right? But something at least in this period of time happened, and they were caught flat-footed. And for me, that was very interesting. The government response to this gave more credence to the theory than anything else, right? Than, than any witness, than any anything like that, you know, because it, this has continued on for 75 years, you know, it hasn't stopped in 47, 48, right? So, but I always yeah. found that that duo between, or that that um, dualism with me and John very interesting where like, I'll, you know, like we'll attack an idea and then we'll have to really pick it apart because John is a very analytical mind, you know, and, for him to accept something like it, it's got to make sense right yep. so like when we approach it it's 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 from two different points of view converging onto one which is nice yeah i'll yeah. say too i mean first off yeah i we do have a great tandem in that way um we'll devil's, devil's advocate our situation our arguments a lot whether we agree with them or not i mean i'll say too the most surprising part of it was you know i didn't have a strong dog in the fight i mean me and tom would talk about these things but i I was always, I would always cautiously take the position of there's probably an explanation for this or probably mm -hmm. someone's lying or the history is getting skewed or whatever. And the deeper into the research, not only is it obvious <laughs> that things are happening, like anyone who I still have, you know, even people that came to Comic-Con uh, and were skeptical, uh, I would just say, listen, just do do research because there's just a, there's too many um uh what's the word if when there's there's too much smoke right mm -hmm. now we there's obviously a wide range of disagreement on what these what these things are what this is what the details are but the idea that there's something really really strange going on here and that the government has lied about and been able to memory hole uh outside the mainstream is uh it's really quite an amazing story. That might've been more shocking than anything. Well, I was like, not only is this obviously real, but no one knows about this. I had no idea. And it's not like mm -hmm. the information is necessarily incredibly difficult to find. You just gotta actually do the work. Um, but when we start from the mindset of, well, this is bullshit to begin with, that, that, that just becomes uh, a sticking point. And that's just the filter you view the world. So anything outside that filter like UFO research is just not gonna enter into your uh, consciousness. So um, really, it was part of getting over that. Um, still cautious about plenty of stuff that me and Tom go back and forth on. Um, As you should be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know who's listening to this podcast who doesn't believe that UFOs are real, but um, I, I'm now a believer because I don't think there's any other way to believe it. There's no... You have to believe that UFOs are real once you get into the research. It's almost, it's almost irrational. I would say it's irrational at that point after the research that I've done to believe otherwise. And that's that's really like a, like a cool segue into like like what we're doing. Basically, like we we really want people to come away with names, dates, events after reading. So they're gonna get a general like 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 history of what happened and they're able to take that information. If they wanna do their research, now they're equipped. And that for me was like the biggest point of this project was like, okay, this is not just like another like like another stupid X file. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love X files, but like it's not something that's just like rooted in complete fiction. People who read this will have an idea of what happened. And again, the names, the dates, the uh, the, the correspondence between, you know, certain military officials. Uh, and again, some of the sightings uh, around military bases, like we put all that in there because like, A, that is a story, that is a history, but B, we want people to be able to take that. And if they want to inquire or, or research even further, they have the tools now, they have the dates, they have the names, right? So this is a way of, 
and I don't want to use the word educating. That's that, that's a little too much. But like this is if you know if your curiosity is peaked, like you're just you're equipped now with the tools to take that curiosity and expand on it, which I think is really like the the for me, you know, the um, the crux of this project. It's 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 doing that. Yeah. Well, and you've you've personified these individuals, and I think that's what's most important. You know, you can read a UFO book and hear a name or see a date. And, you know, it's boring, it's dry, it doesn't stick with you until you hear the story behind it. And I think, you know, giving these people life, giving them character, um, giving them motivation is what really drew me in. And some of those names, I'm like, damn, they dug deep. Like, I, I, I hadn't even heard of some of these people. So immediately, like, I'd put down the comic and I'd start Googling. I'm like, like yup, yup, that, 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 that was the person, yeah. So um, that really stuck with me. Um, but but I kind of want to start here with you guys. This is okay. the first image from the comic. We have a few images I wanted to share with our YouTube audience here. So if you're just listening to the podcast, guys, you can watch this on YouTube as well. We've got some visuals. And you can see these two uh, gentlemen's mugs as well. Um, this is the first image that really caught my attention at the beginning of the comic. Now here we're seeing kind of um, as a Catholic or a Christian, I took this as Adam and Eve, but um, yeah. What made you guys want to start the comic with such a powerful and um, sort of cryptic image? Uh, anyone who wants to take that first. Yeah, John, I, I think this, this particular scene was, was John's idea. And uh, at first I was like, I don't know, do we do that? christian or catholic element into it but i mean the more and more he pitched it the more like it did make sense so i'll, I'll let john uh explain the process behind it yeah mm -hmm. i'm i may like intellectualize it and make it uh, a little too much because um this was just an image that kept popping up doing the research uh, not the image the story of adam and eve himself the idea of this um you know quote unquote forbidden knowledge um whether it's, uh, you know, it, it, so it is, I guess, symbolic in that sense. I, I will say on a more practical level, the why I would make the connection, I mean, it, it, you just speaking as a Christian, which I am as well, but also, uh, so it's not in this image, but it opens, essentially, this is the opening image of a, of a dream sequence of uh, the engineer Albert uh, Diarmond, um, who was a devout Christian and came away with certain uh, conclusions about what these UFOs were, which is very interesting, uh, mm -hmm. I found compelling. And um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to go beyond that. I know I'm, I'm already rambling, but there, there's, no. there's something about the Garden of Eden, especially because, you know, this is, this is such a, a military heavy, USA heavy project where that sort of, biblical narrative that's been woven into um um this country at least culturally uh it just seemed right um and obviously there's a lot <laughs> you can analyze or come away with as to what is meant by uh you know the fact that i'm we're making this connection to the fall of the fall from eden and uh eating the forbidden fruit um you know, I have my thoughts about that, but in terms of, uh, I, I would say on a practical level, it's a reflection of the mental state of the character at the time. Um, yeah, and, this was uh, yeah. 1948, right? This, this, so yeah, we open up this dream sequence, and Diamond, pretty much, you know, devout Catholic, uh, he um, he has his dream basically of like of Eve eating the fruit from the, you know, from the tree of knowledge, the forbidden fruit. So it's like, it's kind of this question like, okay, well, yeah, I can eat it and gain all this knowledge, but then I lose my innocence, right? And it's kind of what the, what Project Sign, uh, you know, the route they ended up taking, like they, they eventually had to come to a certain conclusion, right? But, uh, you know, you, you kind of, you know, once you find out you're not the top of the food chain or, or there's other things out there that you shouldn't really know about, you know, it's a different world after that. It's a different lens by which you yeah. view everything. So, right. I mean, when when John, you know, like John pitched this, and um, at first, again, I was hesitant, but more and more, I was like, you know, this makes perfect sense, especially for a character like Diarman, who, um, mm -hmm. who again was was very religious. Um, you know, S Sunday mass every Sunday, 
uh, volunteered at his church. Yeah, you know, so the, the implications of what this might have meant to a man like that, who's also an engineer and looks at things that are very nuts and bolts, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, now is like, or not all of a sudden, but like after some time, is forced to question his place in the in the not only the world but the universe. I thought this was like a very compelling image, and this came from Mateus, um, who was who one of the artists that worked on this project and did the prologue for us, and he's just phenomenal. You know, he we laid it out for him and he just did his own thing and we we're very happy with the results. Yeah. That's awesome. I'll, well, I'll say too. Listen. Uh, yeah. Please I'll, I'll just say too, um, not to spoil it, but there is something, cause this is like a, a flash forward before moving mm -hmm. back into, uh, you know, the present day of this context of the story. He diamond does something very specific that leads him to this sort of torturous distraught, yeah. Distressed, I should say, distress. Mm. too strong. This distressed state that uh, that starts the series. So okay. that's a little nugget I get. And it's not just about like w the conclusion of what they what he thinks the UFOs are. Um, it's okay. something highly specific that he does. I love that. Good tease. Good tease. And <laughs> yeah. you know, well, and again, like like both of you have different interpretations of what this could mean, and I think that's what's beautiful about uh, an image like this. And you do hear this a lot that the lens in which you choose to look at the UFO phenomenon uh, is is very important. You know, someone religious might think it's an angelic experience or demonic, uh, while a more science based person thinks this might be visitors from another planet. So I, I love this idea that, you know, as this religious character is going to take this journey, um, how will it affect his faith? How will it affect his belief systems? Um, I'm sure that's a struggle that he'll have as the comic goes on, especially with the work that he's doing. So that's what I, I loved. I also love this idea of like the creation story, you know, like this is the beginning of time to many Christians out there. And, um, you know, what could that mean? Were, were there people here before us uh, or living uh, just, you know, to the left or right of us the entire time that we didn't know about? Um, so, yeah, yeah, you could interpret it so many ways. So that that image really stuck out to me. So kudos to you guys. And let's give a shout out, if you don't mind, uh, to the artists. I don't think I even asked you guys that. Uh, who were the artists on the first issue here? So the... Uh our main artist is Ezekiel Anastasia, who, I mean, does phenomenal work. Like we we're very, um, especially when it comes to UFO sightings, we, we don't want to actually show like big aliens coming down a ship. We want to show it from the perspective of like what these people saw. So we, we kind of make it very ambiguous and, you know, like I'm, I'm personally very happy with like how we did Kenneth Arnold, you know, like how we led up to that, to that sighting. Um, so it's Ezekiel Anastasia and then Mateus, and I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong. It's like Villanamba. Um, I have to, I have to actually ask him how to pronounce it. So I haven't talked to him face to face. So like, we're, we're a very small operation. We, uh, me and John live in New York and the artists we work with are in South America that we've been working with for a while. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's like, that's the team, you know, that and Derek, like that, that, that's, that's the entire team. Um, we, uh, we're as grassroots as you can get, you know? Um, and uh, again, we were incredibly blessed to be working with these artists because like they, they just, they come through each and every time, you know? And it's, uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure. It's, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, a amazing work. Um, well, you mentioned Kenneth Arnold. Let's move right, that was the next image that really popped out to me. Every ufologist knows this story. Um, basically the beginning of the flying saucer craze began with, Kenneth Arnold. Um, so I'd love to get your guys, both your, um, I guess, initial thoughts on the Kenneth Arnold sighting and how you chose to portray it in the comic book here. Uh, I thought was pretty interesting in terms of uh, what the military people thought about Kenneth Arnold's sighting. Um, oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. Who yeah, wants to take well, that first? Kenneth Arnold. Let's go there. Let's open that can of worms. Yeah, no, Kenneth Arnold was is a very interesting character, and we're going to revisit him throughout the series because, as John, you know, likes to say, um, almost anybody who who has a, an, an experience like this or, or a sighting like this, it seems like their life their life just gets worse. You know, like the, it never ends well. And with Kenneth in particular, he was he's a very like respected, self made businessman who just had a sighting, and you know, he didn't even like report it so to speak he he mentioned it you know at a uh, on a stop on the way to um to, to i believe it was oregon right um and the word got out and so like when he came out 
uh, you know, he was just mobbed by the press. And he's like, look, I don't know what I saw. I, I personally think it's a U.S. government, you know, craft or, or missiles that they're testing. And this is just what I saw. And this is, you know, like the, he, he pretty ma mapped out where he was the description of what he saw, how fast he thought it was going, which at the time was like 1200 miles per hour. And like, he even dumbed it down or not dumped. He like 1200 miles was like a conservative estimate, yeah. you know, per hour. He, he thought they were going much faster. And this is someone who's flown over this, uh, this particular area, Mount Rainier multiple times. Right. So, you know, he, he's a very interesting character in a sense where like, he didn't want any of this. He didn't want like the, the, the fame and not just the fame, the infamy, you know, because like, what was his nickname after Kenny Saucers? <laughs> you know, like yeah. he was he was not taken seriously after that. And this is for someone like him, you know, it, it also like uh, it, it like inspired this, this curiosity. And he re was really determined to find out what it was, and was really kind of displeased with uh, U.S. officials that they weren't doing everything they can if it wasn't domestic to find out what it was, right? So he was he was very patriotic in that sense, where like this might have been you know either Russian or German, and no one's taking it seriously. Why not? You know, so again, very interesting character, almost tragic to a sense. Um, I, uh, he's personally one of my favorite characters, you know, just because, again, like he he started the whole UFO craze and the silver disc kind of, uh, you know, mythos. But interestingly enough, it's not the first silver disc sighting. It's just the one that made the papers. Um, mm. and I know John likes his character, too. Yeah, I, I love Kenneth. I mean... Again, I, you know, he was coming from outside the UFO world. I mean, he was one of the guys I actually did know about. And honestly, sadly, again, that mindset of there's probably an explanation. You know, my initial thoughts, uh, my initial reaction to Kenneth Arnold, not knowing anything about him, not doing any research or whatever, was, oh, this guy's maybe a little buffoonish, you know. Um, and it's not true at all. I mean, it's anything but. Like Tom said, he was a very respected businessman. He was, uh, his reporting of it, which like Tom said, it's not really reporting, was out of sense of patriotism. Like he was scared. He was like, what are these things? He, he, it was almost like a possible warning. He's like, I have to warn people what if I just saw if this isn't a secret U.S. military project that I witnessed. And if it is, just tell me that and, I'll, and we'll move on. Um, but yeah, in terms of the infamy, it got so bad that, you know, and first off, Arnold was officially investigated. Um, the investigators were impressed with him, impressed with his consistency, his demeanor. Um, there was no sense from their point of view that he was trying to embellish or he's doing it for fame. It was actually the opposite, um, which is also common among a lot of these sightings. It's not like it's these people coming out. Um, they can't wait to tell you. Like there are a lot of these people like you had to get it out of them. Like, I don't want to talk about this. I know I saw something crazy. I know. And they're well aware that um, I you might perceive me as crazy. I know how this sounds. Um, but yeah, with Kenneth Arnold, it got so bad where he was asked later, like, if you saw another sighting, would you tell people? And I, I, what was the quote? It was like, if I saw a floating building, I wouldn't tell <laughs> yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just Good gives point. you a sense of how, how uh, intrusive it got. And how yeah. much it affected and like an anecdote of, of like yeah. just his character and this, this is this is not covered by the series but this is later on like he was invited to um a radio show with, with donald kiko and a bunch of others on, on cbs and um he he was supposed to come there and, and pretty much advocate for you know the fact that these things are real the government's lying about it and just basically talk about like possibly his sighting um but like very straight lace and he found out that they 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 pretty much had people on the program that were going to claim that they were from Venus. Um, they they also didn't give him like any uh, rundown of what they're going to talk about, you know, like so like he he felt compelled enough to to actually send a telegram either the day of I, I forget if it's the day of or the day before the program was set to air, pretty much ripping them apart, saying I want no part of this. This is all this is sensational, nonsensical. Good day. You know, and, and that's just who he was, you know, and again, that's why he's one of my favorite characters. You know, he, he just th there's not an ounce of, of attention seeking or, 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 or fame grabbing that, that, you know, you get from like John said, just he he didn't want this. So, yeah, well, you know. even that interview, because they interviewed he was interviewed. Uh, uh, what was a few days later or whatever on a different radio show, because it became a, a story, right? Mm -hmm. that, he, that he just didn't show up. Um, 
And he said he didn't want, he didn't even want to do that original vi interview to begin with. Yeah. He was doing it because it seemed like these people, they convinced him enough where they're like, no, 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 we, we want to take you seriously. And he wants to tell his story. And he's like, okay, I think it's important to do that in that context. Um, and then when they started giving them a runaround and obviously trying to make these associations between him and uh, these sensational stories and people that are obviously, you know, either grifters or nut nutcases or whatever. And that was where he was like, okay, I'm out. I can't trust you people. Um, so again, Arnold, he just, the guy just couldn't catch a break. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you awesome. know, yeah. And it's sad because imagine if that first reporter, you know, when he landed and kind of reported what had happened, if that first reporter hadn't interviewed him, like, where would this topic be today? I, I can't, I don't know. Would we be yeah. having this conversation right now? Would I be spending, you know, <laughs> 23 of the 24 hours in a day talking about UFOs? I don't know. I don't know. Um, the whole world would be different in terms of this topic and this term flying saucer. And uh, it, it's crazy to think, you know, in an instant, it could have all changed. And um, you guys captured that so well, I think, with his character in this really really well done um the the next uh i guess image that really caught my attention i'd love to discuss with you guys was uh this one right here uh, those um, rockets. Uh, this yeah. is probably my favorite um two pages in the book i'm not gonna lie uh for the mere fact that ghost rockets are not covered that often in the literature there's very few books written about them uh it's a time in history that many um you know, UFO researchers shy away from those more sensational researchers who want to talk about flying saucers, who want to talk about Venusians. But here we have actual reports of these missile like craft or rockets uh, being seen in Sweden um, and all over Europe and even in the United States. Um, so, yeah, I guess, Tom, let's start with you, man. Um, the historical context with the ghost rockets and why you decided to cover it in the in the book. Well, I believe the ghost rockets are probably the first um, the first instance that there might be a novel technology out there that's being used by Russia, right, um, which scared our intelligence officers. So basically, Sweden had a bunch of these sightings where they would um, they would see these rockets, so to speak, you know, like kind of flying over. And some of them even landed in certain places where they kind of they tried to excavate what was there. And officially, they found nothing. Right. Um, but the the main scare here was that these were these were V two rockets that were controlled by radio signals, and uh, it, it's it, for all intents and purposes, it looked like Russia was gearing up right for something, right? Because like in the in the context of history, we had you know Germany just fell a couple of years prior, um, so there were points of control, there were points of Allied control and points of Soviet control in Germany. Where they would pretty much be occupying this land and these manufacturing plants right and what was really interesting they they thought that these rockets were coming from uh soviet controlled uh soviet controlled like plots of land in germany so these manufacturing plants and like they, they were shut down at the end of the war and all of a sudden the allies then start seeing them there's activity in these plants and now we start like hearing about reports of ghost rockets and so sweden thought Russia was either testing a novel missile technology or, try, you know, at the same time trying to intimidate them. Um, and we thought that was very interesting. And like, it was really like, you know, at the end of the war, Russia and, and the U.S., they were not on the best terms, but they weren't on. It wasn't a cold war, so to speak. It was, you know, we just vanquished, you know, the axis of evil. All right. And now we're getting on with this this new era in, in, in you know, like global governments. And uh so when they saw these manufacturing plants uh, open back up and there were German scientists now that were being shipped over to Russia um, very quickly, you know, this alerted allies and it's alerted the U.S. specifically. And they're like, OK, well, what's going on here? Why are they doing this? Why are they testing this? And now do they have V2 rockets that they're able like, basically the first drones? Right. Like, you know, do they have this? Um, let's launch an investigation. And so they did what they could with their, you know, their, their military contacts in Sweden. But ghost rockets themselves, like, ended up ending very ambiguously. You know, it was determined, I think, ultimately that these were, these were, uh, this was a, a missile technology that, like, that was being utilized by the Soviets using German manufacturing plants and using German scientists. 
but that's as far as they got. And when these sightings started happening in 47 on, you know, U.S. Uh, US coast, this was where everyone started look, looking back to like, oh, well, do you remember what happened last year in Sweden? What if that's happening now over here? What if they found a way to bring that over here? And they're just they're testing to see if, you know, these things can fly that far um, if they're able to you know, control them a certain way. So th this was for us the start of the, the Soviet hysteria when it came to UFOs, which was like the very big backdrop of our entire series. Yeah. Yeah. And it's brilliant because you're looking at what's going on in the UFO narrative today when it comes to the Pentagon. And it we're we're seeing this ghost rocket thing mirroring what 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 yeah. what's going on now. You have the US saying these UFOs are showing up in our military training installations over nuclear installations. And we know they're not Russia. We know they're not China. There's no way they could be that far advanced. Um, so whose are they? And it's, it's crazy. You're seeing like this whole thing play out again. It, in the year 2022. Yeah, yeah. It's repeating it, itself. It, and that's what you got to I feel like you have to know where you come from because this is a lot of this isn't new, you know, like a, a lot of what's happening is not new. all the language they're using might be a little different, but they're essentially saying the same thing, you know? And, and yeah. again, like UFOs, uh, you know, or, or yeah, UFOs like being sighted over military installations over, you know, like very sensitive areas uh, like White Sands where they were testing V2 rocket missiles, you know, that happened back then in 47. So this is not a new occurrence. That my, my opinion is that it, it, it's even less contaminated back then because back then it was very clear that this couldn't have been a new drone or a new piece of technology or something like that. It was very clear what the capabilities were, um, you know, technologically in 47 and 48, right? Whereas now it's like, it's, it's no, what if they invented something new, right? But I, I'm sure they had the same feelings back then. And I know this is also one of John's favorite um, uh, pieces of history. So I'll let him uh, yep. take a crack at it. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the ghost rockets, so like we have the flying, the flying saucers for, for the discs, but for ghost rockets, it was cigar shaped. That's what you would see over and over these cigar shaped mm -hmm. objects, um, you know. And if you do believe the research and the and you know that that came back from that and the journalists um, and the books talking about the ghost rockets, what I found the craziest part because, it, like you said, in terms of it not capturing like the imagination like UFOs did, I mean, that makes sense, right? Because they're rockets. They look like rockets. So it's easy for our brains to reconcile. Like, okay, they could have been weapons. And maybe the capabilities that supposed witnesses saw, you know, it wasn't as advanced as they seem to think, right? Things like that. Uh, as opposed to a disc, where you're like, well, we've never seen anything like that before. No one's ever built something like that. It actually as far as we know, is impossible technologically at the time, right? Um, you know, but with the ghost rockets, it's just you'd had these stories of not only would there be multiple witnesses from multiple vantage points seeing these rockets hit, like, crash into lakes, you'd see the water blow up, like, 15-foot water columns up to 20 feet, according to the research. And then people would go investigate. They would The military would come in. Um, and they would try to find debris and they wouldn't find a thing. They wouldn't find a piece of shrapnel, a Crazy. piece of metal. You would see the, the lake would be ripped up from the root. There'd be yeah. dirt everywhere, water everywhere. And they compared it in the research. They would compare when like um, V2 rockets fell from uh, uh, Germany, like fell over uh, like Sweden during the war. And there'd just be it would break up or it would hit it would hit a an empty area like a field and there would just be debris everywhere. But when we came to these ghost rockets, they couldn't find anything if you believe the research. Um, so that to me was the most uh, compel uh, among the most compelling uh, piece of history across this uh, entire time uh, with yeah. the beginning of the UFO phenomenon. I mean, and when like crazy. Kenneth Arnold. Sorry, when Kenneth Arnold yeah. happened, you know, this is where they went back to. They, they right. went back to these files from 46 and like, let's let's open them back up and let's look into it. You know, so we just think it's a very pivotal point, you know, in terms of how intelligence officers are to view this thing, which, again, was, was with a tint of Russian red. Yeah, I mean, that was the official mm -hmm. conclusion right behind for the military behind closed doors. Ra you know, possibly radio controlled missiles. 
yeah. sent from Russia, not meant to attack, right? They weren't, from their understanding, if Russia's doing this, it's not the instant get a war. It's to show, it's basically to scare them. Intimidation. Show off, inti yeah, intimidate right. using new military capabilities. Um, but it really Which doesn't. again doesn't, mirrors doesn't what's happening up. today, too. Right. And yeah, I get, yeah. you know, today, too, I think what we get, like all these sightings and these reports of things that clearly aren't possible, you know, it's easy, but it's easy for us to rationalize like, well, maybe the military is capable of doing these things and we don't know. Um, but at least mm -hmm. looking in the 40s, where it's like, like Tom just said, now we know for a fact that technology wasn't possible then. So, like you said, that seems to be repeating again. And it's easy for us to say, well, like, well, maybe we just don't know that they can do X, Y, and Z. Um, right. But, you know, obviously we, we have a specific opinions about that. <laughs> <laughs> As you yeah. should. The, right. it, you're the Mulder and Scully of this comic book. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure yeah. your roles switch every now and again, too. But, um, well, all right, military. Huge part of the comic, obviously. Um, this final image I want to show really, really stuck with me because, look, you ask any military person why they didn't report a UFO when they saw it, um, not just stigma and ridicule, but these guys were sat down and, like, interrogated ferociously. I mean, I, I've written in the past and interviewed many of the witnesses of the 1980 Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. Over 60 military personnel witnessed a UFO land in Suffolk, England, um, and take back off. And what happened to these dudes and women, I should say, as well? There were military uh, police officers as well um, who saw this. They were sat down and deprived of sleep, deprived of food, um, pumped full of, um, you know, truth serum, as they called it back then to figure out what the hell these military people saw land in this forest between two joint military bases. And they were treated horribly by the people, you know, that they respected, the people that they trusted with their lives, um, their superiors. And this image just really stuck with me. You're, you're seeing kind of the, the, um, the lengths in which they would go to try to figure out what the hell these guys saw out there. Um, so yeah, who wants to take this one? What what are these images? Uh, excuse me. Capture for I'll you. I'll take this one just because <laughs> there's a bit of history with this. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So this was a uh, this is based on uh, Armstrong's report, right? So th this is like as far as we'll go in terms of stretching, like you know what happened behind closed doors. So this scene essentially is based on uh, Armstrong's interrogation with an intelligence officer who saw you know, five or six chrome metal discs uh, and was interrogated. So the information we got, right, was that the intelligence officer at the time was Shulgin from the Pentagon. He basically was annoyed that, you know, he, Kenneth Arnold happened. Now all of a sudden people are, are, you know, giving sightings left and right. And this is all before July 4th. It's a social contagion at that point in their minds, like, okay, this one guy saw something that everyone else was repeating it. They want to get a newspaper, et cetera, et cetera. So he came down and he, you know, interrogated uh, Armstrong about his sighting. And the notes that we got were that Armstrong did not falter and stuck to his, his, his guns, basically, uh, even though, you know, like he was thoroughly like intimidated and interrogated and whatnot. So the, the details of what happened in that, interrogation we don't know right that's not disclosed we don't know really what happened so we took a little liberty it being a comic book and trying to make it visually appealing and also like um there's just still trying to keep it in the context of the story so we don't know if this actually if like you know he was pumped for like the truth serum or, or how harsh the interrogation was we do know that he did stick to his sighting he did stick to his guns and you know shulgin was actually thoroughly annoyed that he had to do this and and and, and be face to face guy he, he was basically there to set him straight and say like you didn't see this you know this is a social contagion why are military officers now reporting this right we can't have this go on so we we put our own little spin on it and this is as far as we will go with like stretching what goes on behind you know closed doors and me and john had a little back and forth because john uh originally didn't want to go this far in terms of uh you know of how 
how thoroughly he was investigated. Right. And I was like, no, John, it's a comic book. We, we have to, you know, we have to draw people in somehow. It still has to be entertaining. But, you know, the more I look at it, the more I'm like, I, I see where John is coming from. So I, I think we got, we had a nice balance of um, what happened and, you know, what could have happened in this scene. It's also just a very engaging scene, like alone. If you take away the historical context and all that stuff, it's my favorite scene in the whole book. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just a like very visually visceral, and that, that's what we wanted. Um, and I'll let I'll let John, you know, give his two cents. Yeah. So I, I'll just say, um, I mean, it is it does look awesome, um, and you know what start what did turn me in, in terms of the research, you know this is a manifestation of like really the paranoia and fear that really did start to grip the military with this stuff. And the idea of them also, uh, another theory that I feel like is barely talked about, um, is, you know, in terms of the reports themselves, um, it wasn't even necessarily that, uh, they thought like witnesses, uh, were seeing things. Also, there was a, there was a theory of, of Russian disinformation agents operating in the U S mm -hmm. um, that's part of the series. Like, are they planting these stories, which is also starting a social contagion. And then everyone starts to see things that actually aren't there. Um, so that was actually real too. And that's really what hooked me where I'm like, okay, then I can buy this. We're like, this is actually, um, uh, you know, the, the, this is something you can imagine actually happening. Um, but for sure, this is a bit of a stretch. I mean, at the end of the day, we never know what these people talk about behind closed doors when it comes to any uh, historical story, for the most part, um, unless you're getting it from a, a memoir and then you have to take the person's word for it. So we, you know, we surround it as fact based as possible with the drama that we have to create. Um, but of course, we want to keep that within um, uh, within reason of what could or couldn't actually happen. Yeah, um, and the sighting is real. The the actual interrogation yeah, all the, is real. That, yeah, you know, he was actually interrogated, and all everything he describes is. And again, this is something we uh, from his report <laughs> totally <laughs> hardcore on me and Tom is uh, descriptions of all the sightings. I mean, don't embellish them whatsoever because I mean you don't have to. The, yeah. you know, um, anyone that no. knows like, even the Kenneth Arnold sighting casually knows like how much are you going to embellish? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, some of these official reports. You know, they read as sci-fi novels. They truly do. Right. I remember my my first FOIA request that I got uh, sent back to me was on the Tehran UFO incident uh, of 1976. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, crazy oh, my God, reads like a sci-fi novel. And these are official DIA documents. It's crazy. Um, is it sci-fi, so yeah. but the true story? Like, you know? Yeah, it's not that the right. Tehran one was one of right. the first major UFO incidents I, I learned about where I was like, holy crap this is uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's stranger than fiction it's too crazy to not be true like it, right you know um, well into you know i think what what this scene sort of embodies is this idea of that paranoia at the time and the lengths in which we would go even on our own soldiers or uh pilots uh to tell us what they saw or if they were working for russia i mean we know for a fact in the 80s at least like Russia was sending people to UFO conferences. This isn't like some conspiracy theory. Like we know for a fact now they were planting people there because these UFO conferences were a place where maybe a military person would come and be like, hey, this highly advanced uh, aircraft was seen. So many people saw it. So of course, like Russians are going to want to know, oh, what what's being seen over the skies over there? And is it ours or is it something we should worry about? Um, yeah, there, there is uh, history and documentation of such things. So, yeah, yeah, I thought it was really cool that you guys covered this for sure. And yeah, it just kept bringing me back to the Rendlesham case where many officers, again, allegedly were uh, pumped full of this serum to tell the truth about what they'd seen or, or whatnot. So, yeah, well done. Well done on that. I love it. I'd love to see this in color for sure. Oh, man. Color is yeah. great. We actually have this scene in color, but again, black and white seems to work so well that like it does. We're, we're going to have two different versions because, I mean, I, I didn't think black and white was going to work this well. It, it just it lends itself to the time period too. And it, with the, yeah, with the I was going to say, 
like it just goes to show you how seriously they take this, how seriously our government took this. And, you know, our whole project is about the government's first investigation into the UFO phenomenon, Project Sign, right? Follows Diamond and Ludding. And the, the takeaway from this, you know, even McCoy, who is a, the general commander, uh, well, no, he, that was actually 20, but like he, he pretty much was involved in Project Sign at, at the helm of it. He even said, we threw everything we could at it. This was at least from what's been declassified, not just the first, but the most comprehensive investigation with the most talented engineers and intelligence officers we had at the time. And I think that's the, like that. That is so compelling and so interesting, and it's wild that more people don't know about this because we haven't had something since Blue Book was nothing compared. I mean, Blue Book was its own thing, but like compared to Project Sign, like I personally don't think it holds a candle, you know. And like you'll have these intelligence officers say again and again, "We threw everything we had in the kitchen sink at it to really, really find out what was going on," and that's how seriously they took this phenomenon, you know. And that that's just something that I think you know if more people um more more people are aware of it might change the lens of how they view this subject well if if our military and our government really really took this seriously to this extent you know like john said there's just too much smoke for there not to be fire yep absolutely you know and i think you know the fact that you're going pre project blue book is uh vital because i think you're right that's when it was untainted it was um really like you said they really wanted to get to the bottom of this for many reasons where by the time we get to blue book you can tell it was kind of a uh almost like a publicity stunt to kind of yeah. kind of calm the nerves of the american public and um tell them we got this it's under control you know either we can explain what it is or people are crazy and you don't have to worry about those those nuts seeing flying saucers. Where sign, you're right. They really were legitimately trying to figure out what this was. Uh, not to say they weren't with Blue Book, but you know, once you get past that, um, after Project Blue Book closed, supposedly there was nothing um, until the world changed in 2017. Yeah, when we learned about the secret Pentagon program, and now. We're living in an age where there's been congressional hearings on UFOs. There's uh, annual UAP reports coming out from the Pentagon uh, about these things. And we just got a new office called Arrow. Um, so I'd mm -hmm. love to get your guys' thoughts on this, where we are in current day in the UFO discussion. The Let me get this right. The All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office is what they're calling it, where they're going to be looking at UFOs and transmedium craft, these yeah. supposed uh, objects that can go in the water, come out, fly into space. It, it's crazy. So, um, yeah, love to get your guys' thoughts. You're working on a comic about the historical context of all this, but we're now living in a new age of UFO uh, investigation within the U.S. government. So, um, yeah, is, is, is any of what's going on now going to influence what you're doing with the work on the comic? Well, it's really interesting what's going on now. I mean, I mean, first of all, I know people have their thoughts about Lou Elizondo and Mellon and, and all those, but at the end of the day, like, where was ufology in the seven, in, in the eighties, the nineties, even in the seventies through nineties? It was in the gutter, right? So the fact that yeah. we even have congressional hearings now, the fact that you know we have Arrow coming out, um, they, they deserve quite a bit of credit for at least bringing it to the forefront of of public perception, right? And personally, I, I do think that what we're seeing is just um, it, it's, the language is very similar. Um, they just seem to be, you know, like it, things seem to be repeating, right? Now they're saying, yeah, there's something out there. Um, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have an office to kind of figure out what it is, right? Whereas in the forties, you know, in fifties, like they said the same exact thing, but they kind of kept it internal. Now this is like a public document, like Arrow came out, it doesn't have to be declassified. Anybody can go on and, and check it out and see that memorandum. Right. So it's important to look at the language that they're using now. You know, the language seems to imply something very hostile, which, you know, might not agree with certain people's um, theories or anything like that. But but again, if you just look at the language and look at like what they're saying, like, you know, uh, around military installations, around sensitive areas, things like that, these seem to be focused around very sensitive military installations, um, which, again, has been happening for 75 years. It just now seems like they're trying to to get it out in 
in the public more. So uh, personally, I think it's because they can't they can't keep a lid on it any any longer in terms of they've been trying to get their their hands around it for so long. And now it's like, OK, well, we this is going to blow open sooner or later. So we might as well get on the ball now. Right. And at least like start start being a little bit more forthcoming. Also, you know, it, it does start like a new era in a sense where I think um, the government would love to just erase the last 75 years of of how they handled, you know, this phenomenon. Right. It, it's a very embarrassing and, and two, like they they ruined a lot of people along the way. Right. So if they if they came out and admit tomorrow, this has been real the whole time. Right. Like there's, there's a lot of people out there that are like, well, you know, I was ridiculed for this. I lost my job because of this. Um, you know, uh, Red Panda has a great documentary series about like how they had a whole uh, they had pretty much like had a whole program to to kind of to make it look like this was a joke. Right. Um, which, by the way, I had one of his videos playing at our booth. So shout out to Red Panda. <laughs> Uh, if you guys haven't seen his documentaries, they're by far the best out there. Like he should be on History Channel. What you're seeing on History Channel now with like the ancient aliens nonsense and whatever, like it, it doesn't hold a candle, you know. Um, but if you again, my general sense is it's it, it does seem to re be repeating itself. The language is just a little bit more assertive now, you know, and a little bit more uh, um, concerning, which for me is very. Uh, it's like, oh, okay, man, that's. Uh, I mean, a lot of us might have felt that way, but now if you guys are saying that, you know, it, it's a little scarier. Um, and I know John has, uh, J John might feel similar in certain regards, but he definitely has his own point of view on, on what's going on and, and how we got here. So I'll defer. Yeah, I'll just say I, 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 trust, the, I trust the government less when they talk about it more. So it's mm. like if I didn't, I, I believe in the UFOs, but if I didn't, the government coming out and making a public statement about UFOs now existing would make me not believe in UFOs because I don't mm -hmm. trust that after 75 years of discrediting people and hiding information and suppressing, suppressing information and harming the careers and reputations of some of the most brilliant uh, engineers and employees and so on and military people you've ever had just to make sure that they are also discredited in uh, disseminating this information. I am very, very um, uh, cautious and I'm also uh, suspicious of why they're now coming out and saying that. Um, you know, if I'm going to assume earnestness, I think Tom is right that um, it's almost like maybe a priming uh, in terms of like, guys, this is going to get out of hand. This is just going to happen. It's, it's going to become more and more regular that we can't deny it anymore. So let's just let it out little by little. Um, you know, but there's still plenty of classified documents they won't release. There's still yeah. plenty of documents they can't even find. I mean, even the estimate of the situation, the original one, um, because there were changes to it, but the original one, we still don't know where it is. They, they believe, we don't know if it's destroyed we don't know if it's in the National Archives somewhere, which it might as well be destroyed because it's like uh, a needle in 100 haystacks. Um, you know, so my direct answer is I don't know. I don't know what to think. Um, but I will say I don't trust uh, the information when um, their game is, you know, to... <laughs> to put it lightly, to massage the truth. And, you know, their their job is to keep us safe and calm, um, mm -hmm. not to rile us up and get us paranoid. And, it, it, you know, um, but but I don't know. Maybe maybe they're they're maybe they are trying to get us paranoid. I don't know. I don't know. I actually <laughs> would be interested to know what you think, um, because you're probably more versed yeah. in, this, in the modern UFO stuff uh, with what's just happening than, than I am. Well, you know, and I mean, not necessarily. I wish I was, John. Um, I, <laughs> any anyone out there who claims to be an expert on these UFO UFOs is uh, lying to you. But yeah, I mean, I do live, breathe, sleep a lot of this stuff and try to stay up to date with everything going on. Um, and I have made it very clear that, uh, at least in my opinion, ever since 2017, since the 
you know, we learned about this Pentagon program and, and threats. We've heard that word a billion times at this point. And um, you've had people like Lou Elizondo come out and Christopher Mellon. And, and I don't know. I, I don't know what to make up all of it. For me personally, ever since that article came out, it's been in, my back, in the back of my mind that this has all been planned. This is all a strategy for some reason. What that reason is, I don't know. But ever since that article came out, I believe that was the moment the strategy began. And I don't know where it's heading, but I do feel that where we are today with this new office, with um, you know the, the way the topic is being portrayed to the public now, that it's all been planned for some reason. I don't know why. I can't pretend to have any answers to that. But um, you look at this situation in... Ukraine and and you're you have to wonder like we did know something was going to happen with Russia we 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 saw the writing on the wall that something was going to happen between Russia and Ukraine our US intelligence has known this for a long time it was just a matter of when and then what happens in the meantime this entire UFO story explodes into the mainstream and now we're hearing there's things in the skies that we don't know whose they are um, and it does truly make me wonder. It, it really does. Everything that's happened from 2017 on, um, is this part of some big game being played between the superpowers? Uh, I, I honestly can't tell you. Um, and everyone talks about Russia, but I mean, look at what China, no one ever talks about China and the, uh, the drone technology that they, they have right now is absolutely incredible. Um, so we got to keep that in mind too. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, that was a very long-winded answer. I don't know. I don't know why all of this is happening now, um, but I find it fascinating. But I also try to remind people, you know, for every military UFO scene over a military installation, there's like a hundred civilian witnesses, someone like Kenneth Arnold, uh, who saw something and uh, is wrestling with what they saw as well. So uh, yeah, that, that's what I try to remind people of. Yeah, for every government military UFO case, there's a hundred other cases out there to look at as well. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's my really rambling thoughts on everything going on right now. I mean, it's it, it's just like interesting because again, the wording that they're using is a lot more pointed and a lot more like like these are this 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 is a threat. Not that this is something that's just might be out there, um, that, that this that this could pose a national security threat. And, you know, again, this was the fear back in 47. And it's almost it, it's wild that it took 75 years to go from the fear to now go to admitting that this is a national security threat if it's not taken seriously. You know, and I, I really I urge people to, like, go and do their research and look into Project Sign. Um, really like look into the correspondences between people like Garrett's original estimate um, from the Pentagon and then the Twining memo, you know, like it, you'll find a lot of what we're hearing and seeing now is being repeated. Um, and, you know, for me, I just have to ask, well, why now? You know, what's what's the difference now? Because um, it does seem like after the 70s, this was just like a whole kibosh on the whole thing. It's just like, we're not even going to we're not going to mention it. We're not going to talk about it. Yeah. And they just seem so, so much more open now. So like, I mean, again, personally, I, I think they're just getting a little desperate and they probably haven't handled it the right way, you know? So now they're, they're trying to hopefully, you know, wrap their, their, their hands around it, but this time with the public involved. So. I hope so, man. I, I do hope the public is involved. I hope they're more transparent than they have been in the past as represented in your comic. And um, I, I can't wait to see where all of it's heading in terms of the comic and uh, in real life. But uh, I got to ask, you know, kind of final words. I told you guys 45 minutes. I've kept you here way longer than that. So you've been gracious <laughs> with your time. Um, what do you hope people will take away from the comic, each of you guys? Uh, what is like the one thing you really want people to take away from estimate of the situation? Uh, Tom, let's I start mean, with I you. Oh, well, you start with John or? Uh, Tom. Oh, uh, I mean, I, I touched on it earlier. I, I really want people to walk away with dates, names, events, 
and have a general idea of what 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 happened and it was taken very seriously and again they can take that and they can do the research themselves and you know i, I do plan on releasing like a list of sources that we've used um and there's just incredible researchers that we've worked with you know like like i i, I hit up jan aldrich um who is kind of a funny guy but he's very straight lace about what happened wendy connors who passed away um earlier this year who you know we had a back and forth for a couple months um and she was extremely helpful i mean she sent us an archive of interviews um with uh with the the relatives of project sign which john i know found extremely helpful like direman's son ludding wow. son the people who are involved you know and these are old school researchers who really kind of cut their teeth in you know like in this idea of journalism like we're going to find out what happened by completing the historical record not by interjecting your own opinion about it you know and i really want to to kind of push that a little bit you know um and also i just i just personally want people to enjoy the story you know i think it's a very compelling story um compelling individuals and again just the 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 estimate of the situation the document itself and the the hypothesis that they ended up coming to or the conclusion rather just the the journey of going from this it's probably a domestic project that we don't know about to uh oh shit, it's not anybody's it's not russia it's not whatever you know spoiler alert by the way but um we think it's a very compelling journey um yeah i'll i'll defer to john yeah i'll keep it uh short because i've been rambling a lot um i i want people to be entertained i i hope it's uh they find it to be a compelling story uh first and foremost i would say um you know, especially for the people who already know uh, a lot of this history, but maybe don't know this specific story, you know, a lot of the, because we're talking to uh, much of the UFO community. Um, and also, like Tom said, just to learn and to also, um, if you are skeptical, to maybe come away from this with a newfound respect for uh, these, uh, the UFO phenomenon and realize like this, uh, this stuff is serious <laughs> it's real um yeah you know there's a lot of baggage around it on both on all sides um but yeah at the end of the day it's a compelling story about a true phenomenon i love that i love that and kind of last question there on that that cover there we're seeing the alien autopsy so i gotta ask guys <laughs> are we hitting roswell are, are are you gonna take us to roswell uh, it's a bit of an Easter egg for the cover. We uh, we are working or planning on um, doing a Roswell miniseries um, because Roswell itself is such a it's such a cluster. I don't, can we curse yeah. on here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you it, can, please. It, it's Especially when it comes to Roswell. <laughs> yeah, no, dude. There, there's so many accounts and so many um, like differing accounts of what happened that day. So. For us to to really get into it, we're gonna have to do a lot of research and tell this story um, as authentically as we can. It does give us a little bit more room to be a little bit more creative uh, in that sense. But you know that cover is an Easter egg. It's a limited cover that we're gonna put out, but it's gonna be its own separate mini series, and we're gonna try to do Roswell justice in a way that hasn't been done before. You know, in terms of like people who, who again with estimate of the situation, they'll read it, they'll come away with names, dates, um, facts and be able to go on their own journey in, in that sense again with roswell though it's just very um it, it, it's very convoluted in in that sense and any historian will tell you like it's still up in the air like what happened did it happen um i personally believe it did i, I think there's there's enough supporting evidence for to make a case for it um but it's also just it, it's such a cool story in in you know in american lore specifically when that video came out uh it was in the 90s you know that took everybody by storm and you know, it wasn't real. Was it the, the, the Santa, Santorelli film, or I, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but Santilli, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a very, it, it was a very compelling piece of work. You almost wish it was real, right? But um, it just again goes to show you that like the Roswell specifically is something that um, is very convoluted, and we have to take some care with it. You know. I know John particularly I, hates that cover just because we show the alien in there, but <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I love it for Roswell. Uh, yeah. I mean, just because Roswell, like Tom said, there's so much mystery and subterfuge around it that uh, we, and it does give us the freedom to be a lot more speculative 
but there's going to be a lot more creative speculation in there that also that will be grounded in at, you know the research um and the circumstantial evidence but um we're going to Roswell allows us to have a lot of strong opinions expressed um because you sort you have to you have to decide what happened there yeah you know at yeah. the end of the day if you're going to tell that story you have to have an opinion about what uh. happened <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm wishing you luck. I know it's no small feat to cover Roswell. Um, well, guys, of course, the most important question of the night. I know you have an interesting rollout for the comic. Um, so whoever wants to take this, when and where can we find estimate of the situation? Oh, man, that is <laughs> that is the question. So we uh, we had a comic book. I mean, a Comic Con limited run. Um, we almost sold out of that. So that was pretty cool. And so I sent out a few copies to members in the community who supported us. Um, you know, shout out to Shane, Tupacabra, uh, Chase, you know, uh, Thomas Whitmore. Uh, I know I'm missing other people, uh, Christopher Woodford. Um, so we sent, we're sending them advanced copies and hopefully they get a chance to kind of get it before anybody else. But we're rolling out with uh, like a website probably next week, probably by Monday by the time this podcast comes out. And that would be blacktielabs.nyc for now, right? We, we're still figuring this out. It's we're like, I can't stress how small we are. Um, so, and people will be able to order it online. We'll be able to ship it out. And, you know, we uh, we welcome any reviews, any, any sort of thoughts, things like that. You know, like we love hearing about what people think about it. So, because um, it helps us inform us as, as we go along with the, this series, which is going to be an eight issue run. So, um, Black Tie Labs at NYC, also uh, Instagram, estimate of the situation. And probably the best place to get updates is our Twitter, uh, EOTS underscore comic. Um, I'm super active on there. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably more active with um, actually being in the community. Like, I'll go into spaces. I, I really won't speak about the, the project we're working on, but I, like, I do like engaging the community and, and hearing different thoughts about this subject. And I, I frankly, I've learned a lot. You know, um, so that's the best place to to check it out right now is uh, EOTS underscore comic uh, at Twitter. Awesome. Well, and hey, um, I got to thank you guys. I, this is just such a incredible project. I'm I'm so happy you decided to pursue this and to see it actually come to life now. Um, I I can't even imagine that feeling. So I I can't wait to see where it goes. My my pipe dream for this is you guys both as actors in New York that we're going to see estimate of the situation in film or on the stage on Broadway, maybe someday. I don't know, but Dude, we um, would love for this to be a movie. <laughs> like I, I personally don't want to, I, I can see it now. Yeah. Like, like Oppenheimer, that trailer came out and like, man, like, why is this topic not taken with such gravity? You know, like, like that in, in a style of that kind of a movie um, grounded in reality, grounded in historical roots. Um, you know, personally, again, like I, I would never want to be in front of the camera when that happens, but I would love to see it come to life. I I see it. I see it happening. The future looks bright for estimate of the situation, guys. So please check it out. Go to the socials. We'll have links to everything you guys are doing in the show notes. But um, yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight on Somewhere in the Skies. And I'm wishing you all the best for continued success for estimate of the situation. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is great.